Hi, I'm Patrick. Welcome back to Comparative Politics. We will be thinking about the second policy area today, um, and it's a lecture about environmental policies. So what are states doing to protect the environment from human impact? And you can think of this lecture as very much being one half of this week, with the next lecture being given by Ingmar Rasolman on energy policies in the global south. So I will lay out a little bit of the broader kind of perspective on environmental policies and Ingmar will go into more detail, especially in a world region that maybe you don't know as much about in terms of their uh, energy and environmental policies. So what we'll do today is we will first think about a couple of key concepts uh, in environmental policy as always. We'll then think about the dependent variable. So what is it actually that we're talking about when we measure, when we analyze environmental policies? We'll think about a couple of possible explanations. So independent variables and hypotheses. And I'll show you one specific case study that looks at variation in environmental policies on the regional, meaning subnational level. So we have quite a bit to get through. And before I dive into this, by the way, I am fully aware that I will not cover very many things. For example, I will talk almost nothing about, uh, I will talk almost not at all about the impact that corporations have on the climate, on the environment. This is very much a state-based discussion and that's purely because I only have 50 minutes. So let's get to it. Okay, so um, first we want to maybe think about what it actually means when we discuss environmental policy. So what do we include here? We could say, rather in general, that that is any kind of public policy that addresses environmental problems or challenges or has environmental goals in mind. If we want to think about this in a little more detail, we can split this up and we can think about specific dimensions of the world essentially of the political world that could be influenced by environmental policy or could be targeted by environmental policy. The first is very simply the physical dimension. So for example, these might be policies that are protecting ecosystems, they might be protecting wildlife, uh, they might be managing forests and other natural areas, they might be targeted at improving or sustaining air and water quality and so on. So everything that has to do with the physical world around us. Environmental policies often though have a social dimension built in where we think about protecting certain qualities of life, uh, where we think about protecting public health, for example. Pollution, of course, is a physical fact, but it is a worrying fact to us because it has a direct impact on human health. We could be thinking about living standards, about housing conditions, about general human behavior, for example. Environmental policies might target specific human behaviors because they have a negative impact on the environment. So that's the social dimension of environmental policy. And lastly, environmental policies could also have an economic dimension. So in this case, they would be, for example, about resource management. How do we get to a more carbon neutral future, for example? How do we foster environmentally based industries? How do we foster green industries? How do we make trade less harmful to the environment? Or how do we uh, safeguard sustainable uh, economic development? So maybe slightly more precisely, once we take these three dimensions into account, we can say that environmental policy is any are any policies that are directed at addressing problems arising from human impact on the environment. Obviously, we might be interested in, you know, say things that occur completely naturally. So, for example, a volcano breaks out and endangers I don't know, a panda habitat or something. That has very little to do, of course, with human impact. That is probably not something that we would normally cover through environmental policies. Environmental policy making is focused on problems that we created and managing the fallout of those or alternatively solving those problems in the first place. So we're mostly talking about anything that impacts, uh, that has to do with the human impact on the environment here. Now, one of the issues that often arises when you discuss uh, environmental policy or uh, if we want to make this a little more specific climate policy uh, it is that these kinds of policies happen at multiple levels and I guess I should say something here at the moment because I did a little bit of a sleight of hand here here and I switched from environmental policies to climate policies 
simply due to space constraints and due to the urgency of climate change as a problem, many of the things I'll be discussing in the coming slides will focus on climate change as a problem, not on all environmental problems. As you could see from the little list on the previous slide, if I did that, I would be here, you know, in eight hours time, essentially. So oftentimes we'll use climate change policies almost as a sort of shorthand to think about the challenges of environmental policies, broadly speaking, and also about the possible variables influencing it. So I'm aware, of course, that it's not exactly the same thing, but for the purposes of this lecture, I'm kind of treating them a little bit interchangeably. So the important thing that I was going to make, uh, the important point I was going to make on this slide is that uh, climate change policy happens at multiple levels. This is true for other environmental policies too. And that is partially the reason why sometimes it's so hard to understand why certain things are happening and maybe why things aren't happening as fast as we would want. So we have, of course, the topmost level, the global level where uh, policies could be made. And the main problem we have here, you know this from last year from ICEP, is that we have no centralized government. So many of the things are soft law. We're sort of hoping that states will follow their self-set um, uh, uh, goals. So generating consensus, of course, is difficult when you have the entire world and enforcing it is almost impossible. So the level underneath that isn't the national level, actually. It's the supranational level. The EU is one of the uh, standard setters here in uh, being a supranational institution that has um, generated a profile for itself as a normative actor, a normative leader. So it assembles a number of countries that like to be first movers when it comes to the right, the correct policy. And uh, it also has a certain scope to set binding targets and binding directives in uh, climate change policy and environmental policies. Now, underneath that, we have the national level government, uh, the national level uh, with state governments. And of course, these are in the majority of the parts of the world, still the main decision making powers. Uh, but they are sandwiched between the levels above them and the level levels below them, because what we have below the national level is the regional level. And we do see in a number of places around the world, not just in Europe, but also North America and some other places, that sub-state governments can play quite a large role in uh, 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 policy making against climate change, for example. Um, so yes, there is some real power there. One of the most prominent examples from recent years was that California, for example, uh, pledged to meet the Paris Agreement standards despite the US as a whole uh, dropping out of the agreement or wanting to drop out of the agreement. Now they're back in, but um, uh, California at least tried to do that. And of course, that is a regional act and not a national one. And then lastly, you have the local uh, level which normally tends to be the key implementer. So when you make actual changes on the ground, you know, uh, changes to how forests and water are managed, changes how to how waste is managed, changes to how um, businesses are regulated, normally the local level tends to be, uh, tends to play the largest role here. And uh, one of the problems that we often see on this level is the NIMBYism. So NIMBY is short for not in my backyard. So in other words, people are, uh, willing to uh, accept certain things as solutions to problems, but not necessarily right next to them. Um, one uh, of those things is, for example, airports. Everyone wants airports or everyone, for example, wants um, good waste disposal sites, but please not in my backyard. So it's hard sometimes to overcome the local resistance to policies, even though in a national or global sense, even they make sense. And of course, communities and citizens play a role too. So that's one of the key already um, dimensions that's important to keep in mind here is that climate change policy is made at a number of different levels and that can make things quite difficult. Now, um, because I want to talk about the global level a little bit more in this lecture than in previous lectures and not so much maybe just do a national level comparison, although we also do that, let's quickly look at the two major things or the three major things that you need to uh, take away in terms of the policy frameworks that have been generated on the international level. Again, here we're now talking about policies against climate change, a sort of a proxy for environmental regulations more generally. So you know uh, that there is such a thing as the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. This was negotiated all the way back in 1992 when I was a, a sprightly 40 years old. 
Uh, it has a ton of signatories, 197, so that's basically all the UN member states plus a couple of additional parties. But importantly, not all the parties to the UNFCCC are also parties to the actual implementations of the UNFCCC because the Framework Convention doesn't actually have mechanisms built in that would achieve these policy goals against climate change. The first actual implementation then of the Framework Convention was the Kyoto Protocol, which with which you are all familiar, of course. It uh, came into force in 2005 and it set binding targets on industrialized countries and the EU. So there was a, a big uh, chunk of countries that were all significant polluters that all pledged to reduce their CO2 emissions and thereby limit climate change. Lots and lots of signatories, although not all signatories also had binding targets in this first period. And the Kyoto Protocol roughly ran from 2005 to 2012, so you might or might not be surprised that the Kyoto Protocol as such is actually no longer being implemented because its commitment period ran out in 2012. The UK target, by the way, under the Kyoto Protocol was a reduction of minus 12.5% of the emissions uh, to under 1990 levels. Um, and as of 2018, at least, the UK has uh, overachieved in this regard and reduced its emissions much more. The same is true for lots of other industrialized countries and the EU countries. Most of them have been quite good at reducing their emissions. But it became clear fairly early on that, of course, we weren't all going to reach the targets we needed by the uh, end of the first implementation period, by the end of the Kyoto Protocol. So states came together in 2015 in Paris and tried to come up with a new framework, a new implementation mechanism. And that is what the Paris Agreement, the Paris Accord, uh, constitutes. Again, this is, uh, has 195 signatories to it, but the uh, way in which signatories uh, commit and communicate and set their goals is different than in the Kyoto Protocol. The key mechanism here is that states set nationally determined contributions. So each state individually will say, we will reduce our emissions by this amount and by this date. These are not set in the Paris Agreement. And that's actually often mentioned as one of, one of the key uh, downfalls of it or the key drawbacks of it is that essentially uh, while there is a legal commitment, a legally binding uh, commitment to set these contributions, there is no legally binding target to what those should be. So in other words, as long as you publish that, yes, we have set a target and that target is whatever, minus 0.5%, you've essentially already fulfilled the Paris Agreement. That's, of course, not the spirit of the agreement, but that's uh, how it is on paper. Both the Framework Convention and the, the uh, subsequent uh, implementations are tend to be discussed, and sometimes parts of it are renegotiated at something called the Conference of the Parties, the COPs. There have been 26 of these meetings, and the next one is actually in Glasgow in 2021. So if you ever wanted to go somewhere, I mean, COVID notwithstanding, if you ever wanted to go somewhere and protest the world's leaders' commitments to climate change, and then I suggest that you book a train ticket to Glasgow in November uh, and you protest there at the Conference of the Parties. So the key differences here that are important to understand between the Kyoto Protocol and the Framework Convention on Climate Change, or I mean, I should have really said here the uh, maybe the, uh, the larger framework here, um, is that the Kyoto Protocol has binding targets. Uh, so states are, are legally uh, uh, required to meet their targets and there could be sanctioning mechanisms. Um, the, the goal in the Kyoto Protocol was an actual reduction of emissions. Uh, states self-reported these and there was a, um, a way of sanctioning these, this, uh, these sanctions that you might incur by not meeting your targets were mostly dealt with through the financial instruments that the Kyoto Protocol itself introduced. Um, chiefly, this was emissions trading. You've probably heard about emissions trading, like vaguely. Essentially, what that means is that every state has a certain budget of emissions that it can use up, and states that aren't using up their emissions budget can sell the gap to states that are polluting more than their budget. So the Kyoto Protocol single-handedly suddenly created an international market for emissions. So states would sell each other the rights to 
uh, emit pollution, essentially, which is a really creative way of dealing with this because, of course, there's many developing countries that had rather large budgets that they weren't using that they could then sell to developed countries for them to uh, pollute a little bit more. So a fairly creative way of getting around this idea of how do you incentivize states to pollute less, um, it's essentially a market mechanism. Now, under the wider Convention on Climate Change, and that includes now the, uh, the Paris Agreement, is that targets tend to be non-binding. So the mechanism by which you have to set targets is binding, but not the targets themselves. The main goal here is not reduction, but stabilization. States self-report, and there's no real enforcement or sanctioning, sanctioning mechanism. And the emissions trading thing is also something that is uh, chiefly done through the Kyoto Protocol mechanism. Uh, there were new, new mechanisms introduced in the uh, Paris Agreement. There were a couple of things like a commitment to technology transfer, for example, but nothing that was as new as emissions trading was when the Kyoto Protocol rolled around. Now, how has this gone so far? Well, um, this is not news to you, but it hasn't, it hasn't been going that great. You see in this little graph here from the Climate Action Tracker, that's at climateactiontracker.org, that uh, if you look at the green line here in this graph, uh, this is the, so this is the black line is where we are essentially at the moment. This is where we, I mean, at least when this was updated, sort of 2018. Um, if all the states had to reach their goals in the Paris Agreement, that is, if we want to keep the world to under 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, then this is how the emissions are supposed to look. How they actually look is this, okay? So there's a huge gap, of course, between what we need and what we are actually doing. You see this again up here, right? This is the current policies. This is what we would need to do, really, to reach all the pledges and targets that were made in Paris. And this is what we would do if we actually wanted to reach uh, the targets that were set in Paris in terms of global warming. So clearly, there is a good bit of uh, there is a good bit of discrepancy uh, between these two things. Now, um, another way of looking at this is the uh, looking at the world and looking at who has actually committed to these uh, nationally determined contributions. So, who has actually updated their contributions over time? There's an important caveat in the Paris Agreement, and that is that you are required to update your national targets as to how much you reduce your emissions. Every, I believe, three years, you need to update those. And if you've committed to them, every subsequent target has to be more ambitious than the previous one. So you can't just say, well, I guess, you know, we reduced them by 20% in the previous period, so that's what we're gonna leave it at. You have to be more ambitious in each subsequent period. And what you see here is that uh, the world looks pretty bleak in that regard. So uh, you have first the world in gray here, uh, 113 countries um, that haven't updated their climate targets at all since Paris. So in other words, they haven't published any updated uh, goals for themselves. Um, you have uh, 45 countries. Those are the ones in, uh, in green, red, and blue at the top here that have submitted new targets since then. But only nine of those have actually uh, followed the uh, thing that was negotiated in Paris and that was to set more ambitious goals. The countries that you see in dark red here um, actually have not increased their ambition. That includes some pretty big emitters like Australia, Russia, Brazil, and Mexico. And then you have countries in uh, blue that weren't analyzed by the specific tracker. Um, but even those countries that uh, have that did propose uh, new targets, only two of them um, have proposed stronger targets than what, we, what they had initially in Paris. And one of them, Indonesia, uh, has actually uh, gone back on some of their promises. So this doesn't look terribly great, especially if you consider that you really are looking at the world in green here, trying to set more ambitious goals and the world in every other color, including gray, not really setting particularly ambitious goals for themselves. Now, of course, no one expects much out of, you know, developing poor developing countries such as Lesotho, but it's still a little bit worrying that this is essentially an effort by, you know, a small sect, uh, a small set of countries around the world uh, to reduce these types of emissions. 
Now, the EU has been at the forefront of tackling climate change. It set its own goals in what was called the 2020 package. Um, the uh, passed a binding EU legislation that uh, stipulated that greenhouse gas emissions were supposed to be reduced by 20% by all EU member states, 20% of the energy had to be from renewables, and 20% of the uh, energy consumption was supposed to be made up by energy efficiency gains. And they institute their own emissions trading scheme. So the EU essentially built a tiny Kyoto protocol within its own area where poorer or less emitting EU member states could sell emissions rights to uh, more to, to heavier polluters inside the EU. Um, since 2020 has already passed, the EU has now updated its package. It's called the 2030 package, and the Commission has proposed to uh, even more ambitious goals for the EU. Now, what is the case, though, is that although the EU tends to be the most ambitious actor on the international level, because the general efforts against climate change are so poor globally, that doesn't mean much. Um, so it's, you know, it's a little bit like being uh, the fastest guy in the slow group, essentially. You can see this a little bit more clearly if you look at the climate leaderboard here. This hasn't been updated in a few years. I hope that doesn't mean anything bad here. But the numbers from 2017 showed that, yes, the EU's goals were quite ambitious, but its member states were reaching these goals at very different rates. So Sweden was overall the best performing EU member state uh, that was rated as good, by the way, not excellent, um, by the uh, EU Commission itself. There's a number of EU member states that fall far short, and that includes, you know, like some fairly highly advanced and economically developed EU member states. So it's not just, for example, that the poorer member states in the Mediterranean and the East uh, are, are not reaching their targets. It's also countries such as Denmark or Austria or Ireland, where you could expect a little bit more ambition uh, in this regard. So a large amount of variation here, of course. And again, this is really, this is the best of the not so great. Um, now, the key research question that we're really asking when we uh, investigate uh, policies against climate change or environmental policies in general is why are some countries better than others or quicker than others uh, in addressing these challenges? So why are some countries leaders and some countries are laggards? As you can see in this little um, newspaper clipping here it can't be anymore that some countries just know more or they are better at uh, grasping the scale of the problem uh, this is a little newspaper clipping uh, famously from 1912 this is a newspaper from new zealand in which in 1912 the author said that the furnaces of the world will be burning 12 million tons of coal a year very soon they emit 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide and the effect of this on the global climate may be considerable in a few centuries. Oh dear, if you could go back and, and uh, pat that guy on the shoulder, uh, that would probably be a good idea. Um, so in other words, it's not the knowledge about climate change. At this point, climate change is a settled fact. So why are some countries uh, leaders in climate policy and others are laggards? That's our key research question. So to understand this research question a little bit better, uh, because we're comparative uh, analysts, we first have to get a better grasp on what it actually is that we're measuring when we say leaders or laggards. So in other words, we have to think about our dependent variable. Are we looking on the one side at policy output? So in other words, what are the political systems producing in terms of the laws that they pass, the programs they implement, the things that they fund, and so on? So policy output on the one side. Or are we looking at policy outcome? So how well are states actually doing because of course you might be able to do, for example, a lot of good with very little, with very few laws, or the other way around. You might pass, uh, pass laws all the time, but they're poorly implemented or poorly executed, and then your outcome can be very bad. So output is not the same thing as outcome. So what do you think? What would be the better variable to measure here? And when I say better, you know, one might be easier to measure, but maybe you know the other one is more accurate in terms of the real world impact. So output or outcome. Then we have to think about the unit of analysis. So we'll have to think about um, what is it that we're actually analyzing? What varies in our research design? So are we thinking, for example, about why different countries are implementing different policies? So is our national governments our unit of analysis? 
or are we interested in regional differences? For example, Scotland v. England v. Wales v. Uh, Northern Ireland. Or are we interested in variation between local authorities? So why are some uh, councils, for example, implementing certain policy and others are not? Uh, and so generally then we can group countries together or that's often done in that way. So once we've settled our, our uh, uh, dependent variable and our unit of analysis, we can then categorize countries either into leaders or front runners. You can call them early adopters, for example, that either adopt more ambitious policies or that adopt policies earlier than others. So they are somehow at the forefront of tackling climate change. That's the one group. Or you can fall into the other group. You can be a laggard or a foot dragger or a denier uh, where you could either be slow to adopt the necessary policies or you could actively promote policies that work against this and policies that harm the climate or harm the environment. Now you could say maybe this binary distinction is actually not that great. Maybe we need a third category, countries that are sort of in the middle, countries that are sitting on the fence that are kind of indifferent to this. Doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be indifferent to climate change as a whole, but they might be, for example, indifferent to which policies are the ones that they should adopt. So countries that uh, adopt a wait and see approach. So that's our dependent variable. Uh, how could we measure this, for example? Well, the first thing that we could measure is policy outputs, for example. Uh, so we have to find some consistent measures that can travel across cases. Remember, it's not just about picking a good variable to measure. It's also about picking a variable that is that works in many different cases and ideally over a longer span of time because, you know, we don't want to just start two years back. We probably want a comparison that goes uh, further back in time. So again, using the same categories that we did all the way in the beginning on the slide is our three dimensions, the physical dimension, the social dimension and the economic dimension of uh, tackling environmental uh, issues. Uh, we could first look at uh, policy outputs that aim to regulate air or water pollution. We could look at things like greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So how, what, how ambitious goals have been set by the countries, how are they managing their waste or their land, or how are they protecting their resources? That's all the physical side. We could also measure, for example, the social side of environmental policy in the sense of, is the state promoting green values? Is it educating its citizens? Is it trying to change its citizens' behavior? Is it regulating building standards to the right degree or incentivizing the correct behaviors? For example, are we incentivizing people to recycle or not? And if so, how are we doing that? And then if we have the economic dimension, uh, where we could, for example, measure uh, how good states are in promoting uh, low carbon industries or green industries, maybe, you know, stuff like solar panels or stuff like recyclable uh, industries that work with recyclable materials. Um, or we could look at uh, the uh, energy obligations that a, uh, a state imposes on its industries. For example, where uh, is the state um, trying to disincentivize, disincentivize high carbon industries from using those resources? Uh, but of course, then we're still not entirely done because we still have to decide, you know, is this essentially a binary measure? Like, are we just looking at whether or not a certain policy is there? Are we looking at a scale of ambition? Like how ambitious are the goals that we set? Are we looking at change over time? So what level have we started and what level are we now? Or uh, at the policy gap, for example, between what we could do and what we actually do. So there's a lot of different ways uh, of approaching the same type of question. Now, the, um, uh, I'm going to show you two ways of measuring the dependent variable, measuring the degree to which uh, states are successful in protecting the environment. The first is the environmental performance index. You can just Google this and you'll find a nice website where they explain uh, lots of the things about the methodology of this. Now, the underlying idea of the environmental performance index is that we compare the largest possible amount of countries on the same scale. Now, to understand how good countries are in uh, their environmental policies, the EPI, the Environmental Performance Index, splits is split up in 60% that are about ecosystem vitality and 40% that are about environmental health. And if you look at the 
uh, graph on the right here, you can see that different things here load on the different dimensions here in this graph. So for example, environmental health is mostly about things that impact you as a human. Um, so for example, things like air quality here, uh, oops, uh, things like air quality, I'm just gonna use my pen here, things like air quality, things like your drinking water, things like how is your waste managed and so on. And your ecosystem vitality on the other side kind of shows you how good you are as a state in managing the ecosystem around you and the resources that you have at your disposal, not all of which necessarily has an impact on human health. So for example, how well you manage your biodiversity doesn't tend to have an immediate impact on human health. Um, what you do against climate change might have, but fisheries, again, like that's an, a, a vital measure because it is about how well you treat your ecosystem, but it's not something that is directly related to health. Now, once they've done all of this, uh, once they've uh, found data on all of this uh, across the countries that they're looking at, they then uh, benchmark this and they build one indicator that goes from zero to 100 and then rank all the countries in the world on it. So if you graph these two dimensions against each other, what does this look like? What does the distribution around the world look like? So let's look at this graph really quick. Uh, you can see at the bottom here is the environmental health indicator and on the uh, x-axis here is ecosystem vitality. And you can see a couple of interesting things here. So the first is, that's not surprising, is that those two dimensions are correlated. It tends to be a rather rare case where a country does extremely poorly on the one axis but very well on the other. So you see, you know, fields like this here and this here basically have no uh, data points in them because that would indicate a state that does very well on health but poorly on vitality or the other way around. Uh, what you can say though is, uh, for example, that if you drew a 45 degree line here through the middle, what you can say is that you have states in the top here that tend to do better on vitality than on health and you have states here at the bottom that are better at protecting their citizens' health than they are at protecting their ecosystem. Um, generally speaking though, you see that most countries sort of end up in the middle doing both things equally well. Uh, and the last thing I wanna point out is that you have, of course, a strong geographic diversity here in these results. You have a cluster here of sub-Saharan African states here that tend to do poorly, uh, especially on environmental health. They are oftentimes unable to protect their citizens' health from environmental hazards. You have on the other side of the spectrum, the global west up here, of course, that tends to be quite good at both things, but interestingly enough, tends to be better at protecting their citizens than they are at protecting the ecosystems around them. And then you have the rest of the world sort of uh, more or less equally distributed around the middle. Although one thing, for example, that's interesting is that regions such as Asia, uh, that's here, the orange dots here, have a really, really big range. So the global west, for example, is all up here, but Asia goes all the way from down here, all the way to Japan up here. I'm actually unsure what these countries down here are, um, but they are doing poorly on the indicators. So the variation is not the same in all world regions. Now, you might be interested to see how the UK is doing on the EPI. Well, actually turns out that the UK is doing pretty well. It's number four in the world as of 2020. Now, what is interesting though, is that this top shelf placement, uh, this top ranking here is mostly achieved on environmental health, not so much on ecosystem vitality. So you see here that uh, up here in these categories, you know, where it comes to air quality, uh, water and waste management, the UK does very well. But when it comes to certain uh, indicators of ecosystem vitality, the UK tends to do exceptionally poorly. So for example, on ecosystem services and fisheries, remember this is 180 countries, the UK ranks under uh, outside of the top 100 in managing this. So a very large degree of variation in how well the UK is doing, but it is doing much better on environmental health than it is in managing its ecosystem. Now, there are, of course, other ways of measuring this. So you could use the EPI to you know, create a global ranking of states and then say like these states are doing well and these states are doing not so well. An alternative to this is something called the Climate Change Performance Index. So this is now not about you know, managing the environment as a whole, it's about climate change specifically, so a more specific policy goal here. 
There's a number of climate action NGOs publish this every year. And this is an index that consists of four parts. It does measure on the one side how well you do on greenhouse gas emissions, how much renewable energy you are uh, generating, how you're using the energy that you have, and how ambitious, for example, your climate policy goals are. Now, if you rank this, um, you get to these results here. So you see that the usual suspects here rank rather highly. So again, the UK, not that surprising because they already did well on the other indicator, ranks quite highly, only one spot behind Sweden. You have a couple of other states in here, maybe some states that you weren't expecting. So Chile, for example, and even India rank quite highly here. Um, uh, on this specific indicator, the EU as a whole ranks number 16 in the world. And you see also at the very bottom of the scale, a couple of countries that you might or might not have expected. You have, for example, the Czech Republic, Poland, Cyprus, Hungary, Slovenia, uh, all EU member states in here that are doing poorly on this indicator. And of course, the lowest possible uh, country here is the United States. What I find uh, always interesting about this specific indicator is that you might have asked yourself in the past minute or so, wait a second, why is rank one to three empty? Who are those countries? What are our usual suspects? If we go down here, well, I mean, it doesn't seem to be, you know, Finland or so, you know, the usual countries we expect up there. Well, it turns out that the NGOs that are assembling this are essentially saying, we're ranking no one from one to three. The highest possible rank you can achieve is rank number four because no country in the world is currently doing enough against climate change. So a bit of a bitch slap here, a uh, bit of a backhand where uh, the uh, ranks one through three are actually not given out. So regardless of how well you do, you'll never get up there. Now, this is the dependent variable. So you've seen there's a number of different ways of measuring this, how well countries are doing, both in terms of policy outputs and on policy outcomes. So how it actually works on the ground. So let's think then of about the other side of our equation. Let's think comparatively what our independent variables could be. So what could explain, again, why certain countries are leaders in this, why certain countries are working strongly against climate change and others are not. Now, the first idea that we could have is simply that some countries have higher functional or problem pressures. So the countries that tend to be more affected by a problem also tend to be more willing to work against this problem and in favor of certain solutions. But in terms of at least climate change, that doesn't really work all that well because the consensus tends to be that there's very few countries that are actually better off from climate change than they are if climate change were not to happen. And what this little graph shows you, for example, is that if you just look at the EU, that almost all states of the EU have some uh, problems related to climate change. So if you are in Scandinavia, for example, you might see uh, a decrease in the snow cover, um, uh, a uh, increasing damage risk from winter storms, uh, a decrease in energy demand for heating, uh, an increase in summer tourism and so on. So some good, some bad. In the Mediterranean region, you have an increased ris uh, increasing risk of forest fires, uh, a decrease in summer tourism, an increase in mortality uh, from uh, heat waves and so on. So what I'm trying to say here is every state deals with some sort of problem emanating from climate change. So just saying those more hit by climate change should do more doesn't really work because I would argue all countries, if you really look at the possible implications, are uh, hit by this and should work towards this. That is, of course, notwithstanding some countries that are uh, in, uh, existentially threatened by this. But if we just look at a, uh, at a place like the EU, uh, the functional pressures are there everywhere. They are just different types of functional pressures. So let's think about some other possible variables that could influence how ambitious your climate change policies are. Uh, is this, for example, just driven by domestic pressures? So how dense your, pop, uh, your population is or how high the levels of pollution? Could this be driven by economic factors? So, you know, if you have a higher economic development, you also have a higher capacity to work against this and maybe also a, a higher need to do this to uh, adjust to the problems uh, that climate change results in. Could this also be due to the importance of certain industries? So if you have, for example, green industries in your country, then you should be more willing to work against climate change because your industries might actually benefit from this. You might be able to uh, support your strongest industries rather than in a country that has high polluting industries and is reliant on those. 
that is a country that's probably less likely to work against climate change because it is doubly disadvantaged. It has the, the biggest problem to work against and its industries will also take the biggest hit. Or are we looking at political factors mostly? After all, we are explaining political outcomes, so policies. So why not look at political outcomes first? How much of a role does it play whether your government is strong and stable, for example? Do you need stability first in order to achieve certain environmental policy outcomes? Do you need an open political system? Do you think that plays a role, for example? And do you need a certain culture of consensus? Or if you have other countries where the political culture is much more confrontational, will those be countries that also have a harder time passing ambitious climate change policies? How strong are your green parties, for example? How strong is your environmental lobby? And how much of a difference does it make whether or not you're an EU member, given that we've already seen that the EU is the most ambitious region around the world when it comes to tackling climate change? Informational factors might play a role, for example, how well informed you are, how much research you produce, how much you buy into the scientific consensus, how educated your citizenship is, uh, your citizenry is. And then lastly, we could also think about some issue specific factors that could explain these policy outcomes, such as external shocks or how visible certain environmental problems are. There are, of course, more hidden um, uh, environmental problems, you know, a reduction in biodiversity, you know, certain bird or mammal species going away or even worse, like some snails or something going away. That probably doesn't bother the most people. If you have large scale problems, such as the classic Waldsterben, the dying of the forest in Germany, you suddenly might have a wake up call for an entire society uh, that then decides that it has to tackle this specific problem. So when I grew up, for example, Waldsterben in Germany was like the big thing. The acid rain was coming down and was killing the wonderful German forest and that couldn't happen. That is, of course, something that's pr pr pretty specific to Germany uh, as a political system. So these are all perfectly uh, valid uh, independent variables that we could look at when we want to explain differences in policy outcomes. Someone else has done us the favor and done this, of course, not just them, but also other papers. But this is a highly cited one. This is a paper by Lieferink, Arts, Comstra and Uivar. That, who in 2009 looked at 21 European countries, they added a few non-European ones, then they looked at specific environmental policies, and they looked at the whether or not countries were implementing those policies, and if they were implementing them, how much of a gap there was between their current policies and the strictest policy in the sample. By the way, that's a pretty creative way of measuring how much of a laggard or a leader you are, right? Are you close to the strictest policy in the sample of countries or are you far apart from that? They tested a couple of independent variables, not all of which I'm going to go through here, but they did find that overall all the variables in blue showed a significant effect on your environmental policies. So if you were very developed, if you had the right institutional structure, so a corporatist institutional structure that was good as was environmental pressures and EU membership. What played no role was culture. So things like uh, religion, for example, Roman Catholic majority countries versus Protestant countries that didn't play a role and trade openness, how integrated you were in the global uh, trading system also didn't play a role. The single most significant variable that could explain why you were a laggard or a leader was whether or not you were an EU member. If you were an EU member, the chances that you were a leader were much, much higher, but this model was still overall pretty bad at explaining the variation. So in other words, we know a little bit about what determines policy variation in environmental policy, but we don't know that much. And some of the things we know aren't all that settled. Just to illustrate this with two, with two uh, quick graphs, these uh, relationships between the variables. So we talked about political variables having a, a potential effect on the ambition of your environmental policies. And we do see that that seems to be borne out by data. So what happens in this graph here is that you see on the vertical axis here, that is an index of fragility. I think that's the fragile state index that we've heard about in the democracy lectures. The higher you are, the more fragile your state is. So no wonder that Somalia is up here. And then on the horizontal axis, we have your environmental performance as measured by the EPI that I introduced earlier. So the further to the right you are, uh, the more uh, you, the higher you score on the EPI and the better you are in, in environmental policy. 
And we see that this is a really strong relationship here. This is a correlation coefficient of 0.71. So in other words, how fragile you are determines a lot about how your environmental performance is. Now, of course, there could be all kinds of problems with this, uh, that not all of which I'm going to go through. Maybe we can talk about them in our live stream a little bit. One of the things that you might think about is who is, uh, who is falling short of our expectations, for example. Uh, so if you think about the horizontal axis being the EPI, so how good you are on the environment, then if you take, for example, a country that is here, such as Uruguay, that scores about, what is that, maybe 53 or so on the EPI, but the relationship, the general relationship between stability and performance, which is that line, would lead us to expect that Uruguay should be all the way over here because it is a very stable state, right? And for very stable states, we also expect them to be really environmentally friendly. So technically, Uruguay should be over here, but it's all the way over here. So in fact, every state that you can see that is on the left side here of the, of the line, of the red line, we would have expected them to do better given their stability. So all of these countries here under the line essentially are doing worse than we would expect just based on their stability. And see if you can find some countries here uh, that might have surprised you. The same, by the way, goes in the opposite direction. We have certain states that are doing quite well on environmental performance, such as Egypt over here. Purely based on the line, we would expect Egypt to be all the way over here um, in terms of environmental performance, right? Because it's not a very stable country, at least this was in 2014, not a very stable country, uh, but in fact, it is environmentally much better off than the, um, uh, than the fragility would lead us to expect. Okay, so uh, the other uh, possible uh, relationship that we could explore, we've already said this, right? Is this just an economic thing? You know, the more e economically strong you are, the more you tend to do for the environment. And that, again, tends to be roughly borne out. Again, in this graph, we see this, this is our regression line. This is the general relationship between your GDP per capita here and your EPI. Again, high numbers are good. So the higher up you are, the better you are on the EPI. And what we see here is that, generally speaking, most countries are on the line. So if you do get more prosperous, you are also scoring higher on environmental policies. But we see certain countries overperforming. So countries that are above this line here, countries such as Denmark, for example, up here, are overperforming because their level of GDP would only lead us to expect this level here of the EPI, but they are in fact much higher other countries, all those below the line, uh, score much poorer on the EPI than their level of uh, than their level of prosperity would lead us to expect. So this is the so this shows you just generally speaking the the uh, the the relationship between these variables. So they definitely do have something to do with you, with each other, but we tend to not be able to explain everything perfectly. Now on the very last two slides here for the for the last couple of minutes. I want to tackle one specific level of analysis that we haven't talked about all that much, and that is regional variation. Now, in this case, we're not talking about regional variation as in world regions like Europe versus Africa versus Asia and so on. We're talking about regional variables as in subnational regions. We've already heard in the case of California that subnational regions sometimes have the power to diverge from the nationally set goals in terms of uh, protecting the environment or working against climate change. So a couple of things are important to understand here that could lead to these regional variations. So one is constitutional capacity. So how much power is devolved to regions underneath the national level and to what degree can they make their own policies? So to what degree can they implement their own environmental uh, regulations, for example, or tax different things. Uh, so can they disincentivize certain behaviors through taxes? Regions can also have different bureaucratic uh, capacities, for example. They tend to have less policymaking capacity than the national level, simply because they have fewer resources, a less uh, a, 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 a smaller size bureaucracy, fewer people working on this. But some regions might have more capacity than others. They are more closely linked, of course, to, to local policy networks, which can sometimes help uh, drive more ambitious 
policies. We could have differences in territorial integrity, so some regions might actually pride themselves, might consider it even to be a part of their national identity or their regional identity to be environmentally progressive, for example. Few regions pride themselves on being environmentally regressive. That tends to not be the case. You tend to boast of you being better than others in this regard, not worse. And there might even be certain a certain territorial one-upmanship. So you want to be better than all the other regions within your nation state uh, at tackling climate change, for example, or protecting the environment. Um, uh, and of course, they are, uh, there are certain multi-level opportunities here. So as I said before, in the case of uh, California or in the case of the UK, we'll come to this too, regional governments might want to be more active than the national governments when it comes to tackling these policies. Now, uh, our colleague here in PIR, Nicola McEwen, who researches this kind of stuff, published uh, a pretty interesting paper in 2015 uh, that looked at the differences between Scotland and Wales. So regional differences in um, taking action against climate change. Now, this is a really interesting case study because I think for the first time in this uh, entire course, we are now comparing subnational units. So we're comparing the constituent, some of the constituent states of the UK uh, with each other rather than comparing entire countries such as the UK with Ireland, for example. Now, Nicola and her colleague came to this study with two specific hypotheses. They said, one, well, if you have a region that has greater constitutional powers, then we should also expect that region to show more policy ambition. In our case, Scotland has greater constitutional powers. More powers are devolved to Scotland compared to Wales. So, Wales, uh, so Scotland should also be more ambitious in setting climate change policies. And then the second hypothesis was that there are certain policy areas that are more devolved than other policy areas. So this is the same, of course, across Scotland and Wales, or roughly the same across Scotland and Wales. Generally speaking, Scotland and Wales can do more in terms of emissions reduction than they can in terms of energy policy. So they have more freedom in reducing emissions, for example, than they have freedom in incentivizing renewable energy over nuclear power, for example or other forms of uh, fossil fuels. So two different hypotheses here, right? Regions with greater powers should be more ambitious and in policy areas with more powers, we should also see more policy ambition. The independent variable here is constitutional capacity. So our possible explanation is constitutional capacity. So how many powers are devolved and in what area? So that's our main explanation. And our dependent uh, variables are policy output and outcome in these two fields. So how good are these subnational units, Scotland and Wales, in uh, dealing with their emissions and in uh, affecting uh, energy, a change in their energy policies. And interestingly enough, what Nicola and her colleague found was twofold. So the first hypothesis was indeed borne out. So yes, because Scotland had greater devolved powers, it also was more ambitious. So what we observed was in line with our expectation here. But the other aspect was that we expected countries, uh, we expected both um, states to be more ambitious on emissions than on energy. But what we did actually see is that, at least in the case of Scotland, Scotland was very ambitious also in terms of energy, even though they were more constrained there than in the other policy area. So a greater than expected policy ambition in both areas really was an unexpected result and went against our initial hypothesis. And what Nicola proposed here as a possible explanation is that policy networks can play a large role. So, for example, in both Scotland and Wales, you have national parties that tend to be quite um, progressive or environmental issues. That's both goes for the SNP and for Plague Cymru. Um, and then on the other hand, you have certain aspects of national identity where both Wales and Scotland, at least according to this paper, have a degree of environmental protection built into their in territorial distinctness. So they are trying to distinguish themselves within the larger UK, for example, by being specifically environmentally progressive. And they say that that drives the larger policy ambition, even in areas where we weren't expecting that.
Okay, let's sum up really quick. Uh, as we look at environmental policies, there's a real need here for conceptual clarity because we have environmental policies, including climate change policy, but we need very different measurements to understand environmental policy versus climate policy. And of course, different measurements can generate very different results as we've seen in the previous lectures too. Just the fact that we can find correlations like between fragility and the EPI or between prosperity and the EPI are fine, but we do need some theoretically informed analysis before we can say that yes, these two things are actually connected and the one thing is not just, uh, and both things for example aren't just caused by an underlying third variable. We have to think really hard about our unit of analysis and our scale of analysis. So what time frames are we looking at? What levels are we looking at? The global, the national, the regional. And of course, we have to be really clear about how we measure our specific variables, both on the dependent and the independent side, when we design any research that tackles environmental policies in a comparative way. Now, that was maybe a little bit abstract, maybe a little bit theoretical, maybe a little too global for your taste. That's all fine. Uh, we will continue, though, in, this, in a similar line here uh, with the next lecture by Ingmar, where we look at energy policies in the global south with some really interesting applications and some maybe insights into regions that you hadn't previously thought all that much about. Thanks very much for your attention so far, and I'll see you in the next one.